Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Davani. I have a very, very special guest today, Anessa Allen Santos. Uh, she's, um, well, where should I start? Anessa Allen Santos is a, welcome, Anessa. Thank um, you. <laughs> welcome. Is a Florida, I'm just going to read it off. Uh, is a Florida okay. licensed attorney. She's the founder managing attorney of IntelliLaw. Uh, that's a website, IntelliLaw.io, which I'm going to post later. She has 15 plus years experience providing trusted business counsel to disruptive technology companies on matters of blockchain and digital currencies, business law and consulting, corporate law and governance, and intellectual property, technology, and securities. Okay, that should be it. And the practice areas would be, in short, blockchain, digital currencies, business and corporate law, business consulting, corporate governance, intellectual property, security, te technology. So you can check out our website. Anessa, why don't you, you know, uh, just start off and, you know, tell us, tell the viewers who you are, your background, your expertise. I mean, you're one of the most, I think, leading, uh, you know, one crypto wonder woman I call in, the, in this space. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you've got the branding, but because, you know, you also, you know, you, you deliver value and information and share a lot of knowledge on LinkedIn. This is where I'm following you. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. so go ahead. Yes. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Kayvon. Well, you know, it's really interesting because as you're kind of reading back some of the information on the website, it, it reminds me my digital media and marketing team um, I analyst, right? They've, they've got a little uh, out office. They're headquartered in Miami and, and um, Randy is the uh, CMO of that company. And he comes into my office, right? Because he helped put together my website, but I had to write all the copy and he sits down and he says, okay, I want you to tell me which of these areas of practice do you focus on so I can focus on your SEO. And I said, Randy, I said, I do them all. And he says, how is that possible? And I said, it goes like this, right? I get a new company as a prospective client. They come into me and they say, I have this great idea. I have this revolutionary new technology that I would like to design and develop, maybe patent, license, protect the trade secret, but I need investor money, right? That's the securities aspect of it. And, and I need to get this thing off the ground and I need you to help me. Where do I start? What do I do? And so this is, these are the kinds of clients that I represent, and I literally help them with every single one of those areas from idea to exit. And I learned how to do this because I have over 20 years experience working with technology startups, developing out proprietary patent portfolios dedicated to the creation of new technologies for unified communications and collaborations, video network operations, and managed network services. And in this course of experience, and then in going to law school, you know, throughout that, um, throughout that time when I was working with those successive companies, developing out these patent portfolios, we would sell off little bits of our companies, and I would lose my job, and then the guys would get together and say, oh, but we can do this, right? We can build off of what we did before and start a new one, and then we'd sell that, and I'd be out of a job. And so after doing this like four or five times with different companies, I said my idea of job security was to start my own law firm and the jury's still out on whether or not that was actually a good idea <laughs> but blockchain blockchain came came knocking on my door i want to say about two years ago maybe um time flies and and i'm not i have to sit down and think about exactly when it first occurred but i'm on the technology law committee of the florida bar association and our chair of the committee al cycle uh, he's a data security and privacy guy and a big firm in Miami. He says, you seem like you know something about data and data management and network infrastructure. He says, so I want you to build out a presentation to deliver at the annual Florida Bar Conference that's going to be available later for technology continuing legal education credits to the 107,000 member bar. And I thought, oh, wow, okay, so I really have to work hard at this because I don't want to look like an idiot in front of my colleagues. <laughs> so I studied, but I studied deep into the weeds of exactly how blockchain works. What is it? How do you, how do you build one of these networks? Why are some of them secure and some of them don't seem secure? Why do I hear about these hacks? 
if they're so spectacular? What do you mean data that's recorded on a blockchain is immutable? And why is it important, right, this concept of hashing? And why do we have these different consensus algorithms? And what are these math problems that everybody's talking about? right, that the nodes on the network have to compute in order to record a blockchain chain. So I, I really got into all of this, and 105 hours later, I was ready to give my presentation. And it went really well, and I was really surprised. And I thought, oh my gosh, it looks like I'm gonna be doing more of this. And, and in order to be able to competently represent my clients, I went ahead and I took the blockchain strategies class at the Said Business School at the University of Oxford, England. And let me tell you, it kicked my butt. Oh my gosh, it was so hard. It was really challenging and it was 20 hours a week on top of my already full wow. schedule. Mm -hmm. But it was so worth it. Oh my gosh, it was incredible. So if anybody is looking as to how to consult and advise companies on how to integrate blockchain technology into an existing or prospective business plan, right? this class really teaches you how to identify the networking layer, the protocol layer, the application layer, and exactly how to put it in. And so the more I learn, the more discussions I give, the more lectures, the more panels, the more requests to come and speak. And it's, it's getting it's getting really exciting to kind of see all of the different use cases and the way that blockchain is going to impact people's lives for the better. And I really do believe that blockchain is going to become the central nervous system for my children and their entire generation. And we're going to see it in absolutely every vertical of our lives. And what I really got excited about was what blockchain can do for the people that are economically disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's two-facing, the benefits for blockchains that really kind of are going to revolutionize human rights on a global scale. On the one hand, if we are to integrate blockchain into existing government financial uh, infrastructures, then what we're gonna have is a perfect audit trail and we'll be able to see every penny that's coming in to the government bank accounts mm -hmm. and we're gonna see exactly where it goes out, how it is spent. So did that toilet seat really cost $15,000? I don't think so, unless it's made of solid gold and I wanna go and have a look at it, right? Because it didn't do that, that's a lie. They lied to me. Where is my money going? Where is other people Exactly, going? the tax it is money. Yeah, I mean, full transparency, world. right? Yes, we it's the ultimate for. truth machine. Mm -hmm. It forces people to tell the truth. It forces people to be held accountable. And so government spending is going to be much more controlled because you can't lie, right? I love that. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, what I really love about it is that when you take blockchain and you apply it to KYC compliant identities, which is something that India is working for with its Aadhaar system, Singapore just recently implemented a program for digital identity uh, stored on a blockchain that's available via API, right, for banking and financial institutions. You can just sort of release your information for that purposes. So you've got self-autonomous identification registered and stored on a blockchain with multi-layer biometric authentication that's built into it. And so now all of a sudden we've got, we're bringing in all of these three and a half billion people in the world that are either underbanked or just not banked at all, right? Or no Simply. identification, right? I mean, there's, exactly. I mean, at least mm -hmm. one or two billion people that have no identification, right? Yes, yes. Um, um, the statistics are anywhere from 1.1 billion to 1.2 billion. Actually, just don't even have an ID at all. Their government didn't yeah. get around to giving them one. Mm -hmm. And and that's going to be solved. And it's a project that I'm working on with my um, fintech group right now. So I, I signed up for the Oxford fintech class. I'm a glutton for punishment, I know. But I can't resist <laughs> because it's so exciting, right? Yeah, so you talked about the article that I wrote, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But what blockchain can do for these people is what's really got me excited, right? We're holding our governments accountable. You can't spend our money on stupid stuff and then bringing these people into the economic system so that they can, can have an opportunity to participate. Oh, it's, it's so exciting. This is what I love about it. This is why I do what I do. 
Wow, amazing. Okay, let let me transition because uh, this is uh, you just uh, you know uh, hit the nail with this uh, with all the uh, keywords that you just said uh, to your article. To your amazing, really, everybody should read that. Uh, it's on uh, LinkedIn.com. Everyone who you know wants maybe to connect with you or can they see it? Can they can they go into your uh, in article without? Okay, so I'm just going to. Uh, you know, let you uh, let you maybe you know in your own words summarize uh, the the story. But I, I found it very touching, and it it shows you know your empathy, your ethos, and your vision, what blockchain and especially the Bitcoin blockchain uh, can do for for you know for the average person, for workers, for people. Is it's it's this uh, person with a pseudonym name uh, Roberto whom you, you know, it's already done, it cannot be undone, but the injustice that has been done to him, that's how you, you know, you described, this is where, uh, you know, this decentralized structure, this architecture, this, this the Bitcoin transactional mechanism can come into play and really, for the first time, maybe in human history, you know, help, <laughs> help the poorest of the poorest um, uh, on an existential level. Uh, go ahead, because I got, I got your, um, article here pulled up uh why don't you tell us a little bit about that article that you wrote when was yeah. that uh, yeah just go ahead and scroll right up to the very top of it if you're that, able to that yeah, way sure. people they can you know you they go. know there yeah that way people can when they go and they find it they be like oh yeah it looked like this that's the right one so right well there was this <laughs> one of the companies, one of the startup tech companies that I was working for, right, when I was in law school, there was a hostile shareholder takeover, and I was ousted along with senior management in my third year of law school, and I was like, crap, now what am I going to do, because I have to pay back all this law school debt, and I said, this is a great opportunity for me to go and get criminal defense experience, trial, litigation, right, because lawyers, they ought to know their way around a courtroom, so I joined the public defender's office of Southwest Florida, where I was responsible for the largest criminal docket out of five counties, right? It's called the 20th Judicial Circuit of Florida. And I'm fluent in Spanish. And like I mentioned earlier, I was a diplomacy and human rights major with a concentration on Latin American and Caribbean. So I'm fluent in Spanish and I'm now studying Portuguese. But I represented a lot of folks from Central and South America and Mexico as well that traveled to Florida to work the agricultural fields. And it's really, we have a situation in Central Florida that is very reminiscent of slavery. And there actually is uh, illegal slavery going on in many of these agricultural for, uh, fields. And the situation that I had, we'll call his name Roberto. The story that I told in the article is 100% true. His name is not, I made that up. And, and Roberto uh, was a field worker from Guatemala whose Spanish was very bad because in Central America, there are still many. Native American indigenous language is spoken like Iche or Kampubo. So Roberto comes, he's brought to my office there in Fort Myers, Florida with somebody who had a driver's license that could drive him and also who kind of helped translate a little bit from Spanish to, to the Native American language that Roberto spoke. So it was kind of like multi-communication and no English, um, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But, but the point is, is that Roberto uh, was on his way to a Western Union to transmit money back home to his family. And, and there was an unmarked police car that was following them that tried to pull them over, like with lights and stuff that were in the front of the vehicle, but not on top of the vehicle. So they didn't pull over. And then eventually they ended up being forced off the road, pulled over, and Roberto uh, was pulled out of the car and he was violently robbed by the police officer under this idea of criminal forfeiture, which I think is unconstitutional, but that's another conversation. And basically the argument of the police officer was, what are you doing with these several thousand dollars? You shouldn't have this kind of money. It must have something to do with drugs. And I, I asked Roberto and the other guy, I was like, well, wh why didn't you pull over? And he said, well, because uh, we were afraid that it was a Guadalajara hit. And I was like, well, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. What is this Guadalajara hit? And he said, well, you know, Guatemalans are relatively uh, smaller. They're, they're shorter necessarily genetically. And um, there are other indigenous groups that are also working in the fields in Immokalee that are much larger. And so they follow them to when they're on their way to Western Union and they rob them and they beat them violently. And if the hit is successful and you get some, you get a Guatemalan successfully and you steal all their money, it's like winning the lottery. So it's a Guadalajara hit. And I was completely appalled 
And, you know, I, I didn't know that these poor people, like, first of all, I did gardening. I did a lot of gardening when I was a public defender. It was my, my happy place. And let me tell you something. People don't understand this, but you can die under the Florida summer sun, especially in central Florida. Mm. But it's easily into the triple digits. These people are out there at the crack of dawn until the evening hours picking 4,000 pounds of tomatoes for $62. This is slavery. It's yeah. outrageous. Yeah, outrageous. It's terribly yeah. upsetting. And, and, they, and what I didn't know was that they had no safe place to store their money, mm -hmm. right? Because they didn't have a government ID that was acceptable so that they could just open up a simple savings account. So what they would do is they would keep their money on them. And in triple digit temperatures, of course, they're soaking wet. I was, right? When I'm gardening and I'm out there for like two hours and I'm ready to pass out, like I'm not kidding, like beat tomato red face, very dangerous. They're out there all day long. So the money gets soaked with sweat and then it dries, right? When they keep it on them and they keep it with them. And so it ends up being very moldy and the cop completely stole it from him. And, and he could never get it back and I couldn't get it back for him because I wasn't authorized to do that as a public defender. That would be a civil action. And I was only able to keep these people out of jail. That's all I was allowed to do. So here he is, he's slaving and everything is stolen from him. His family gets nothing. He can't open a bank account. The cards are stacked against him. And Americans don't know that there is slavery in their backyard. Yeah. That there are people out there that can't open a bank account, that there is no safety for them, that they are being horrifically exploited. And this was so upsetting to me. Obviously, I haven't forgotten it, right? And it's been years and years and years since I had this situation. And I'm still writing about it. And, and it was when I was preparing to do sort of this 30,000 foot view of explaining blockchain smart contracts to my colleagues for last year's annual Florida Bar Conference. It's two o'clock in the morning. I remember exactly what I had. And, and I was in the weeds of the technicality. How does blockchain work technically, right? The network infrastructure, how do you build it out? What is the protocol, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was two o'clock in the morning and I was sitting right here in my pajamas, of course. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is it. This, this solves the problem. Yeah. This, this is what fixes it. We can give these people a self-autonomous, biometrically multi-factor authentication, you know, for, for self-autonomous identification that meets, know your customer's standards, right? And boom, they can get a bank account, problem solved. I mean, if, if, if that's not evolutionary, I don't know. You know, it's beyond revolution, I always say, because revolution always, you know, we have no time for revolutions, I always say, because it's always about struggling, conflicting, changing something. But no, we just create a new structure and the old one just becomes obsolete. You know? <sighs> yeah. So, wow, you know, I mean. But there's more. Yeah, tell but me. But there's more, <laughs> right? Because our listeners are like, okay, great, Roberto can open a bank account. Fabulous. Now what? That's just where we get started, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because because a lot of people, especially like I'm, you know, a lot of folks that are listening are, are folks that are sort of in the industry and they may be highly technical. I'm imagining that they're probably economically advantaged and uh, you know participating in the system, and they might not understand that when when you have nothing to lose is when you do things out of desperation. Exactly. And because you're just trying to survive. Yeah. Become and, creative. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> So you get really creative and, and yeah. I get that. And it's something that I understand and that I can actually respect and appreciate. And so what was really amazing is that when I was doing my blockchain strategies project, um, my, my group actually focused on refugee identity. And I, I didn't actually select that. I, I, I was the one in the group. I wanted to do something else. And I don't even remember what it was that I wanted to do. I'd have to go back and check my notes, right? But I wanted to do something else. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this and you're coming along for the ride. But I'm so glad they took me for the ride. <laughs> because if you read the article, right, yeah. and what you'll learn is that there, there is a crisis in Jordan with Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. We all know this, right? Mm -hmm. This is old news. But what's yeah. really interesting is that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 16.9 guarantees an ID to everyone. And I think that everyone deserves an ID, right? Because what, what can you not do with an ID, right? Like you can't go into, to, you can't go yeah. in a bar and order a drink. 
You can't get a library card to take out a book. You can't get a bus pass, right? You can't, I mean, you can't register your kids for school. You can't get immunizations for your, you can't get anything, right? You need an ID for absolutely everything. So these people are just like out. And, and so the UN sustainable, De um, the sustainable economic development goal is 16.9. Everybody gets an ID. Mm -hmm. And so they applied this 16.9 to the Syrian refugees in Jordan. And they put out this pilot program with called Building Blocks, which is a blockchain world food program put together. Mm -hmm. And what was really amazing is that they registered all these people with retinal scans and they gave them a whole new ID. And refugees under the United Nations uh, Refugee Convention of 1951 and its 67 protocol have a right to an identification because most of them flee in a hurry. People don't get that, right? If you're a refugee, you're not thinking, oh, gee, maybe we can leave like next week on Wednesday. Let's pack everything up and make sure that we have all our papers. That's not what happens. Mm -hmm. Usually, right, you're being shot at in the middle of the night and you grab your babies and whatever you can in five seconds and you run for your life. And usually your ID isn't part of that grabbing <laughs> and getting yeah. out the door. So these people just show up and they're like, hi, my name is, and I'm from, and they got nothing, right? And that's it. And so they, at these UN camps, when they are qualified as refugees, they are provided a brand new ID, but in, in this country, in the United States of America, it's just like, it's, it's on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And it's stupid. Mm -hmm. So what happens is there have to be people who work in the refugee camp and they take the refugee together with their piece of crap, doesn't look like anything, or you just printed it off your printer ID and they try to register the children in schools. They try to get you a job, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big problem. So the UN and the building blocks program said, no, 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 we're not going to do this. We're going to register you biometrically and we're going to put you on a blockchain and we're going to also going to issue you your money on the same blockchain. You, everybody's going to have their account, right? Because when you're a refugee and you're qualified as a refugee, you are given a certain budget for you mm -hmm. and your family. And then there are participating supermarkets. So you can actually go and get food and diapers and things like that. But with this system, it gets lost, damaged, destroyed, stolen, et cetera, et cetera. When you're biometrically registered, somebody would have to like pop out your eyeball, plus cut off your finger, right, to, to get access to your funds. But what's really exciting that we found out through that program is that when you read the studies and the results of the studies, that by utilizing this blockchain system and giving people access to funds over a blockchain instead of on a plastic debit card, they were able to save $150,000 a month in bank transaction fees. Uh -oh. Amazing. And what they found out is that now they have a registry of all of the financial transactions of that person. What does that sound like? A credit history. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Now we have somebody who was fleeing through their life with no ident identification. Now they have an identification. Now they have a credit history. Now they have an immutable, fully audible, like transaction trail that guarantees who they are and what they're about. And they're literally kind of get like this new startup kit in life. Mm -hmm. And they can really start fresh. Whereas all of these folks that don't have access to that kind of resources, their only choice is to be vulnerable to situations like Roberto slaving away in this cycle of poverty and despair with no out. That yeah. breeds desperation. Yeah. Right? And it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, we got like 2019 and I mean, it's incredible thinking about it. I mean, we're not talking about the past century or something, you know, <laughs> it, that's the crazy thing. It's like, and that many, and it's like, it's not like a few singular cases, but what we're going to ask you, you said uh, they issue, you know, money on the, what kind of money are we talking about when they, when you say they issue in that kind of program, they issue money on that block on the, I mean, is it like interchangeable a medium of exchange or, you know, monitor medium exchange, or is it like, what is it? It's not Bitcoin, is it? I mean, uh, you know, I didn't, when I was doing the program, um, I was focused more on the identification benefits of the building blocks, uh, yeah. blockchain, and I didn't get into the money transactions, but yeah. that's actually what I'm looking into for FinTech, right? Mm -hmm. Is I'm working on that now because 
you see, I got really excited just about ID on a blockchain that when I met a local Bitcoin ATM company, I said, this is great. We could service all these people. And they said, no, we can't. And I said, why can't we service all these people in Immokalee? And they said, because our Bitcoin ATMs were required to meet KYC standards. And I said, okay. why? I don't remember this. This was me back before I, you know, well, I had done... Well, it was just months ago, and I just even, keep learning. Even for a frac- <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, even even for a fraction of a fraction, I mean, you know, there there should be like a, um, you know, a level level level. What do you call it? Like a, a levels of of, uh, of 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 KYC procedures that you know they can implement. Okay, I would understand that you know if it's a certain limit that you know that is just beyond that limit okay you know go get yyc anti-money laundering i mean give me a break but uh, it, i know for existential no, I mean, reasons you know yeah it's it's basically in in my best estimation this is banking collusion um mm-hmm. they just because because of exactly what the building blocks program showed that 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 the inclusion of 100,000 syrians and conducting all of their transactions over a blockchain and not with a bank issued debit card the bank lost out on $150,000 in transaction fees a month, a month, per month, right? So that's well over a million dollars a year that they're missing out on because these transactions are being conducted on the blockchain and they're missing out on the bank transaction. Uh, of course, yeah. being mm-hmm. Issued on plastic to these folks. So, so all I can come up with is collusion. And so here's, here's what I've learned since then, right? So I was really excited. I'm like, great. Let's just deploy Bitcoin ATMs everywhere. And now Roberto and other people like him that are still out there working in the fields of Mamakli, I'm just going to set out a Bitcoin ATM. Here's what I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking, just go ahead and put your $62 a day into your Bitcoin wallet, you know, your Coinbase, you know, whatever it is that you're using is, is your digital wallet. And then your, your wife back in Guatemala, she can have within minutes access to the funds, it's free Western Union, don't care about them. But then that's when I found out that even to to set up one of these accounts and to use a Bitcoin ATM machine and insert your cash, you have to meet KYC plus, right? Mm -hmm. More than KYC. And I was like, I I don't understand this. And they're like, and so they're like, well, we're a money service business. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Right? Because I'm a corporate technology lawyer. I'm not a financing and banking, you know, banking and financial services lawyer. I'm like, what are you talking about? So they're like, well, you know, we're regulated by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and we're regulated by money transmission laws and each of the 50 states have its own money transmission laws and you've got the federal sort of FinCEN regulations and if we're not regulated by FinCEN, then we're regulated by the the SEC and the OCC and the CFTC and I'm like, oh my God, this is like an alphabet nightmare. I don't know what you people are talking about. (laughs) Stop talking. I just want Roberto to be able to insert his cash. <laughs> so, so, you know, I talked to one of my colleagues who was amazing, right? Drew Hinkies, he's been in this space for a couple of years longer than I am. And I'm like, Drew, what is this about? Like, what's going on, right? And that's what he does. Like, he's not the guy that you want to talk to about intellectual property, right? That's me. But he's, he's the guy that you want to talk to about banking and financial Good service. complimentary. Oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah. What's going on, Drew? I need you to explain this to me. So Drew gives me, like, the 101. I, I was like, shut up. This is insane. I don't understand what is happening here. So, you know, I have my subscription to LexisNexis, like every other good practicing lawyer, Alexis or Westlaw. And so I'm like typing in there and I'm like, what's going on? And I'm pulling up all of this information on KYC and AML and CFT and BSA and, and all of it. I go, right, those are just the regulations and then all of the agencies that govern it. And so now I'm in, right? Oh. Now I'm really oh. in. And I'm like, this is bull crap. I don't like this at all. And now I have to figure out how it is that I can get people with no ID, a KYC compliant identification so that it can operate as an API that existing banking and financial institutions Mm -hmm. will accept. Because remember, the problem I'm trying to solve is Roberto needs to insert his $62 somewhere. (laughs) <laughs> somewhere mm-hmm. he needs to not be carrying it on his person because he's going to get violently robbed really injured 
And if he's not violently robbed and injured, then the cop is going to steal the money from him under criminal forfeiture, both of which are equally atrocious. Yeah. So I'm trying to find a place for Roberto to put his money. Now, um, that's, that's where I'm at, right? That's, that's the issue that we are faced with. There are a but- lot... You know what? What's so hilarious because we're talking constantly about the fiat crypto uh, conversion. Now we are far away from mass adoption. That's that's the crux. That's the dilemma of this whole thing. Because what if Ro- so Roberto or any mm-hmm. other worker would mm-hmm. be paid directly in satoshis or what a Bitcoin on his mobile wallet? There you go. I mean. Th- what do you need a KYC for then? It's, it's uh, non, you know, totally not, uh, disintermediated, you know? I mean... Because um, he can't open a mobile wallet without yeah. an ID. Yeah. That's yeah. where we are, right? He can't, yeah. he can't even get an account. He can mm. get a mobile phone. Somebody yeah. will give him a mobile phone. We hand those out like candy in this country. And remember, right, so folks that are watching from other countries, I have to ask for your forgiveness that I am so central to the United States, right? But there's two reasons for that. Number one, the United States is a really gigantic country and it's really hard to get out. And so it keeps me very busy just trying to figure out the horrific mess that is our regulatory system here. Um, here. Number two, um, I don't know anything about what's going on anywhere else. And it's not because I choose to be ignorant. It's because it's such a mess here. I, it's, it's awful to figure it out. It requires all of my attention. But number three, and I think this is the most important one, the United States has the most restrictive nightmare set of regulations of anywhere on earth. So if we were to look at it just from like the Security and Exchange Commissions, and I know we're going to get to this later, right? You know, STOs, Mm -hmm. ICOs, that whole thing. And we'll talk about that, right? But what I think everybody needs to understand is that the securities regulatory landscape of the United States is the most restrictive so that when big companies want to go out and do an offering and raise money from prospective investors, and they want to do this in multiple countries, they start with making sure that they first meet the U.S. regulations Mm -hmm. because they are the most restrictive. Because if you can meet United States regulations, then you're pretty good for everybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. So we start with the U.S. because it's awful. It's the most awful Mm -hmm. of any place else. Right. And so I don't know yet. I'm learning. I don't know yet if U.S. KYC AML regulations are the worst, but I'm suspicious that they are because we're pretty good at screwing things up. And so this is why (laughs) this is why I'm so focused on the U.S. regulatory environment. It's not because I want to ignore what's going on everywhere else. That is certainly not the case, right? But those are the three primary reasons as to why I'm so myopically focused on the U.S. regulatory environment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay, let me, before we transition to that uh, other topic, which I wanted... Um, now, from your perspective, in your position, uh, why do you think a lot of people, even you know, highly intellectual, intelligent, or scholar, academics, Nobel Prize winners, uh, or whoever, you know, have such a hard time understanding the power, the essence, the real transformational power of Bitcoin? Um, in mm-hmm. you know monetary economical sense, I mean I've been mm-hmm. you know there is no other, there's no topic that does not touch upon Bitcoin. Once you get into Bitcoin, you get into Austrian economics, you get a you mm-hmm. know a, a real yes. understanding what is you know the ish, the, the 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 core of money mm-hmm. uh, and and the central banking system and the fiat money and and all that. Uh, why is it so hard to understand, you know, the transformational power or what it really, you know, when it comes to hardest money as opposed, you know, to gold, which is hard money? Uh, do you think there's a lack of understanding or confusion or is it just like, you know, decades of indoctrination, maybe a hundred years of indoctrination and brainwashing, you know? Yeah, I actually have an answer to that question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's because they don't know how blockchain works. Mm-hmm. So, so primarily the, the first, the first obstacle that we encounter in these conversations with folks in the banking and financial institutions is they, they think that blockchain is this and that Bitcoin is that, right? And they don't know 
they, they don't know that they're the same thing. So here's how I explain it to them. It's something that they can understand. I say, this is your phone. <laughs> your phone is hardware and software. And the hardware and the software work together so that you have apps that work on your phone and you can access your apps. And they said, yes. I said, great. Your phone is blockchain. Bitcoin is an app. <laughs> That's how I explain it to them, right? And it's, and it's, not, it's not the perfect explanation yeah. for all of us out there that are technically in the world, but, but it, it's a really great metaphor. And all of a sudden the light bulb goes off in their head and they go, oh. I said, yeah, no blockchain, no Bitcoin, no blockchain, no smart contracts, right? You got to have blockchain first. And so then they start asking me questions and, then, and that's good. When they start asking me questions, I'm like, okay, they get it. Now they want to talk about it, right? So if I can get them talking about it, then I can sort of persuade them over, right? And I learned how to do that as a criminal defense attorney, how to really persuade people to my argument. So they say things they're like, yeah, but so if... If blockchain is so secure, then how come all these these uh, blockchains are getting hacked? I read about another hack like every <laughs> paper. There's like another hack, and I'm like, okay, well, I can explain that to you, <laughs> right? Because if they're getting hacked, then they're not sufficiently decentralized, and and that's where you really get into the weeds. And and this is where folks don't really understand. They're not taking the time to understand the actual physical properties of a blockchain infrastructure from a networking perspective and the attributes that a blockchain can have, may have, mm -hmm. how you can add them or not add them, right, into a particular blockchain, and that it really has a lot to do with the size of the blockchain, which is determined by how many master nodes you have on the network, right, who's, who's performing them, the geography of the master nodes, the ownership and operation of the master nodes, right, and so, these questions, the summary of the answers of those questions determine whether or not a blockchain has a central command center, like maybe some of the IBM Hyperledger Fabric blockchains that are, you know, a, a specific consortium of companies that are controlling and operating it on a permissioned private blockchain network that folks can't have access to, or whether it's like this mega mammoth blockchain like Bitcoin with thousands of master nodes that are coming online and offline and there is no central command it's its own unique living breathing organism that no one person or no one group of people controls and when you achieve right this this um, ethereal sort of concept of decentralization which nobody has identified exactly what that looks like just yet because we're just mm -hmm. now talking about it when you've achieved that then it can't be happening Exactly. Then it can't be hacked, right? Mm -hmm. And and in the um, I'm developing out a master blockchain presentation for the technicalities of blockchain, and I have this one slide. And in the slide, you can see like a DNA strand, right? Mm -hmm. And like sort of like a, a weird looking digital body in the background. Mm -hmm. And I use that photo to sort of uh, evoke an image in people's minds that when you have a truly decentralized blockchain, that in order to hack that blockchain, you would have to overcome 51%, right, of the cells in your body at the precise moment when none of those cells were in the process of cell division. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't happen. And that's what it what it's like to try and hack a mega mammoth blockchain. You yeah. have to overcome 51% of the master nodes at that precise point in time when none of them like are authenticating and writing a block to the chain. And when you yeah. get to this mega mammoth size. It, it just can't happen. Yeah. That's why the Bitcoin blockchain isn't hacked. That's why Ethereum isn't hacked. The DAO is something else. People don't, don't talk to me about the DAO. That wasn't an Ethereum hack. That was, <laughs> yeah. that was this other issue. And, and the reason why we see such volatility in our digital currency valuations is due in large part to, again, the US government coming in and screwing it up for everyone, right? So basically everything was going well until the Dow Genesis hack and the investors contacted the SEC and said they've lost our millions and millions of dollars. And the Security and Exchange Commission came out with a, with a formal ruling and said pretty much almost all digital currencies that are being issued in these ICOs are securities. None of you followed securities laws and now we're coming after each and every one of you mm -hmm. and they're in the process of doing that. So that was number one. Mm -hmm. And then what really killed the value was the Internal Revenue Service of the United States. Okay. Because they came out with an announcement at the same time and they said, oh, and by the way, we're taxing you. 
and we are going to tax you as property and we're not going to tax you as you know currency or some other methodology for taxation and so basically what that said is that when i used bitcoin to buy a bottle of water or my starbucks coffee that i had to figure out what was the value of the bitcoin right when i bought it and then what was the value of the bitcoin when i bought my coffee and then i have to do the accounting to determine whether or not i had reportable gains or maybe losses yeah and to do that for microtransactions the accounting cost was more expensive than what you could gain. So I actually had a client who's like a Bitcoin miner, one of the earliest in the space, who had programmed an autonomous sort of, um, it, it was an AI program. So what it would do is it would go out and it would troll all of the digital currency exchanges in the world. And it would read when this coin was at this valuation, then sell and buy this coin. And on and on and on it would go. And they would, it was micro, 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 Mm -hmm. amounts of US dollars, right? We're talking pennies, mm -hmm. but it would, it would operate on its own. And so he would wake up the next day and he might have made a thousand dollars while he slept. <laughs> and so the accounting that the IRS required shut him down. And then the IRS started subpoenaing foreign exchanges for mm -hmm. records of operations for US investors. And, and so the exchanges literally closed down US accounts and said, we don't want to deal with the IRS. You people are a nightmare. Bug off. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so. It's true. Mm -hmm. So the IRS and the SEC in particular are largely responsible because then the U.S. market activity shut down. Just woo, boom, right? Including my client who's really mad. And, and it hasn't picked up again. And so when we get the banking and the financial institutions and they're like, well, this is bull crap. The market is volatile. Nobody's trading in Bitcoin. They have no idea what they're talking about, so, right? Yeah. They, they, they don't understand the technology. They don't understand the use cases and they don't understand how the U.S. regulatory environment is so collusive and so in favor of the banking elite that they will do anything to proliferate extended poverty. It's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um what I was gonna say yeah so um the you know the the, the all this uh, ICO uh, space um it mm -hmm. had you know it has left a really tainted reputation and you know I mean of, there's a lot of scam a lot of incompetence a lot of non-delivery of substance you know I mean there's just a handful of of, of uh, ICOs that really right now are delivering numbers data you know they got a professional team they got a track record they got you know serious ethos behind it they got a roadmap you know they got a substance it's all about you know return of investment in the, yeah. at the end of the day or some kind of functionality but most of those uh unfortunately have has has left uh you know a truly um really bad reputation and and tainted uh image uh in this whole space so now transitioning to the uh, so-called security tokenization which the sec now has had you know a lot of discussion what's your take on that i mean do you think with the security tokenization and uh, you know and now serious delivery of substance of return investment of uh, can you tell us a little bit about the procedure the, the complication the bureaucracy the regulatory framework what is necessary in, for example, just a practical example, someone wants to, you know, or a group of people in, uh, you know, entrepreneurs want to, you know, get some real estate together in a pool and, and uh, form, you know, a, a sort of a, a investment pool and make out of this a security tokenization and to, uh, to provide a fractional ownership, return on investment, dividend to, amongst others, U.S., you know, small investors. Yeah. How, so you actually asked like three different questions. In there. Uh, just, <laughs> okay. yeah, just, just give me your, your, your yeah, yeah, your Sorry. overview. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to go through and we're going to answer all of them, right? <laughs> so, so the first issue that you brought up was the big problem with the pump and dump schemes and what was going on with all of these fraudulent ICOs. And, and, we can, and I think it's really important to address that because it's a big issue that a lot of people want to talk about. It's like, well, isn't this all just some giant scam, right? Because that's what people say to me. And I'm like, well, I kind of totally understand why you say that, but no, it's not all a giant scam. <laughs> and, and so, you know, 
one of the arguments people say is, well, people are using digital currencies to commit crime. And so my answer to that is a former criminal defense attorney is, yeah, and so if we shut down all the ways in which people commit crime, then let's do away with the American dollar, let's do away with the British pound, let's do away with the Venezuelan Bolivar, right? Let's just shut down all currency because, honey, that has been used to commit crime forever. Right? In order of magnitude, yeah. <laughs> In order of magnitude, yeah. I love that. Absolutely, I'm going to start adding that on. Yeah. Billions and trillions, yeah. <laughs> Money laundering, but okay, that's it's a taboo. Okay, we can't talk about that, you know. So first of all, don't talk to me about digital currencies being used to commit crime because I don't care. Because <laughs> mm. that's we've been using things to commit crime all the time. U.S. dollars are key for committing crime. All right, so we've answered that question. Now we can move on to the next one, which is. What happened with all these ICO pump and dumps? And I say, well, uneducated, uninformed investment is what happened with pump and dumps. Yep. Because there are people on this earth that no matter what, there are people that are trying to get a quick buck and they will lie to you and they will cheat and they will scam. And, and if it's not through a, you know, a pump and dump ICO scheme, then it's going to be something else right? It's, it's always going to be, there are always going to be scammers out there and they're always going to be trying to take your money and will use whatever's going on in the world at the time to their own advantage. I mean, every time there's a hurricane in Florida and it knocks down all the houses, you get a lot of roofers who say they're going to come and fix your house and they take your money and they don't fix your house, right? So it's just what happens. And it's really important that the investor do their due diligence. They have to do their due diligence. Now, these initial coin offerings, by and large, were always securities offerings. They always were securities offerings. They always should have been registered, right? Because any time that you are asking somebody for money, right, and then that person is going to give you a check, and with the expectation of profits mm -hmm. from the efforts of others, like you, mm -hmm. the person that's asking for the money, that's a security. Exactly. And so, it is, right? Yeah. Right. They are mm -hmm. all securities. And so people are like, well, why didn't the SEC do anything? Because they're busy. Because there are scams going on all the time, all over this country. Mm -hmm. And there is no way they can possibly track down and prosecute all the scams. This is because because they couldn't, there just wasn't enough people. Yeah. And so it's, how does the SEC pick who they're gonna go after and when they're gonna go after when they get phone calls? So we have the saying in this country, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, <laughs> right? And so people have to complain before the American government will step in and start doing the research. So with the Dow Genesis hack, $60 million, right? They called up the SEC and they said, hey, you need to do something. This is like big numbers here. And the SEC said, okay, fine. Right. And so they got into it and they're like, what are you people doing? Right. You people are crazy. You can't just all of a sudden throw in blockchain and be like, okay, now it's not a security. Of course it's security. It's always a security. And so now the SEC has relented and said, fine, we're going to put together a task force and we're just going to go after everybody because they're all securities and we're going to issue 400 subpoenas. And you know what? Those subpoenas are coming out and it's happening. Yeah. And the SEC is cracking down on it. So they were always securities. So what we see now is a shift in terminology in the marketplace. So now if somebody says, I'm doing an ICO, right? The initial like knee jerk reaction is to say, oh, well, it must be a scam, right? And so for folks who don't know, a pump and dump scheme means that you pump false information into the marketplace to inflate excitement surrounding your, your, your offering, right? Security or not, surrounding your offering. And then when all the money comes in, you dump your own stock and you run away with the cash. <laughs> So, so that's what pump, pump information, dump and run, right? That's what a pump and dump scheme is. And, and so now we have people saying, okay, well, we're just not going to call it an ICO. We're going to call it an STO and we're going to file it with the SEC. So basically this has changed the entire dynamics of how it is that these things are structured, built, and offered. And now we're hearkening back to what the actual point of blockchain is. And blockchain is a data management system that's really fancy and it has all these great bells and whistles and properties attached to it. And that's what we really like about it for tracking securities. So when you're talking about a small startup, 
and like in the scenario that you suggested mm -hmm. and it's like well me and my friends got together and we want to pool all of our money and we want to invest in a couple of different real estate properties in Miami because it's really, really pretty there. And, and the summer is warm and the people are gorgeous. So let's find some places in Miami, right? <laughs> Yay, Miami. So, well, anywhere. Miami yeah. Is, right, right. Well, I'm kind of partial to Miami. It's my crystal city on the sea. So when you're on South Beach, you got to look backwards when the sun is rising over the Atlantic and all the buildings are sparkly. It's really really pretty so mm -hmm. that's why i like miami for that view in particular right but so anywhere you can do it in orlando because i don't know you haven't been to harry potter world at universal studios enough so <laughs> wherever it is <laughs> so you're buying some property so what is a blockchain use case well in that particular scenario you can build out a blockchain and you can attach it to the equity right your exactly. shares stock in the company and so it's just it's a really fancy database management system for who owns what stock and what are the properties and attributes of that stock and it can become really interesting right because you can program it in that, that maybe there's a minimum holding period depending on how it is that you're conducting your your offering to raise the money there's a minimum holding period right so but but uh you're going through a divorce and you need to pay your divorce attorney so you need to sell it well you can't you can't violate securities laws because it's been programmed in mm -hmm. so it kind of prevents fraud prevents securities violations it keeps you from doing things that you shouldn't be doing and also more importantly it prevents right fraud on the part of the corporation from from screwing up the capitalization table because mm -hmm. it's programmed into the software and and in a small company it might not be as useful in say a gigantic company right so when you're thinking about a mega mammoth corporation like maybe apple and Apple is a publicly traded company. And you think about all of the investments coming into Apple and all the investments going out. What are all the trades? How many trades of Apple stock happen on a daily basis around the world? Now we're talking about a really good use case for blockchain because maybe, I don't know how many trades actually happen. Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? I'm guessing probably thousands, but I might have no idea what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, not to mention the buyback programs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right? I mean, so like, I, I honestly don't know, but I'm thinking people can probably imagine, they're like, yeah, it's probably like thousands, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're thinking about transaction reconciliation, who has voting rights on the mm -hmm. time when maybe, you know, the public has an opportunity vote on an Apple router, how do you determine the cutoff date as to who owns the stock on this date and the reconciliation of when that's going to occur happening in minutes rather than in days and who has voting rights and who doesn't have voting rights and what was the value of the stock at the time that it was sold, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you've reconciled it, is the value different than what mm -hmm. it was at the time when the order to sale was actually put in? And so we're getting things down to the second. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really important because we need to know who owns what, when, who has what rights, when can they exercise them. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and you can't lie. <laughs> and that's important. <laughs> yeah. Full transparency. Nobody yeah. gets to lie exactly. anymore. Mm -hmm. No more lying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like the use cases of an STO. Now, here's what I talked about at the core summit. Because we wanted to know about, like, when we're doing STOs and startups, and here's, here's a warning that I want to put out there that I want everybody to think about, is that the, the cost of building out a blockchain for the purposes of managing a tiny cap table of, like, 10 people in a brand new startup, right? Mm -hmm is it's really expensive and so it's this is a use of proceeds that you have to talk to your prospective investors about and you have to get them on board because it's a very expensive endeavor and at that small numbers in a closely held corporation when pretty much anyone and everyone can see what's going on in the company mm -hmm. anyway and it's really hard to hide fraud and things like that and it's hard to screw up the cap table at those smaller startup numbers is there really a justification for spending all of that money on developing out a blockchain just for that? 
and maybe there is. Maybe it's a great marketing gimmick. Maybe you want to start out your blockchain small because you have this program where you plan to grow mega mammoth because your plan is global domination. And everybody's plan should be global domination. And, and, and so maybe you want to start out small and then grow it as you build. But the cost is so extensive in a small startup that this is something that you need to talk to your prospective investors about and say, mm -hmm. by the way, here's the blockchain use case. Here's how we're going to utilize it. Here are the applications. And this is why we want to do it. This is how much it's going to cost. And we want you to be on board on this. This is subject to disclosure under the disclosure laws of the security exchange commission. Mm -hmm. And it's something that ought to be really considered. But what about the Ethereum? I mean, uh, what if you don't, you know, you don't, uh, because it's been scaled, it's been tested, Ethereum, the Ethereum, I mean, you, uh, there, there shouldn't be much preliminary costs of preparation. If you want to, if you really want to, you know, give out a security token, that's not a big deal. I think uh, the, the process, you know, of uh, issuing security tokens and registering prospectus obligation, you know, as we say in, in Austria with the Financial Market Authority. So I, I think in Austria, it's about 100,000 euro, uh, the, you know, getting it rolling, sort of just a preliminary phase. What would it be in the United States? Or if we came like, you know, if a, co if a company or a group came to the United States and said, hey, you know what, we want to issue this uh, and, and also sell it to U.S. citizens. Right. So it depends quite a bit on the type of offering that you're going to conduct. So, you know, obviously I discourage startups and scale ups away from initial public offerings. And the reason why I do that is because they can cost, you know, easily several hundred thousand dollars in accounting fees alone. And startups mm -hmm. just don't have that kind of cash. And there's really no reason to go public. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of different exempt offering vehicles that I recommend that the experienced practitioners are going to like issue deep offering always. They should. If they're not doing that, folks, if you're, if you're watching this and you're thinking about doing an offering in the United States, if you've got a securities attorney and your securities attorney is like, hey, let's go out with a Reg A plus, right? And it'll only cost you 150 grand. <laughs> I want you to ask your securities attorney, and why are we not looking at Regulation D as an option? Right? Or why are we not running a concurrent Regulation C out for crowdfunding plus a Regulation D 506C and then maybe working our way into Regulation A+. Mm -hmm. right? So the experienced practitioner starts with the Regulation D. Your attorney could potentially not be suggesting it because it's cheap. Because it's the cheapest way to raise money in this country. And the lawyer doesn't get hardly any fees off of that. So okay. the experienced mm -hmm. practitioner can start there. So the cost of an offering under a Regulation D can be anywhere from maybe like $5,000 to $50,000. And why the huge change? Because how long have you been in business? And, and what is your financial history? Like, have you been in business for one year? Have you been in business for 10 years? Because the longer you've been in business, the more I have to look at for prospective disclosures to investors. It's all about the disclosures. The SEC is all about the disclosures. Mm -hmm. So how much material do I have to go through? How many problems do I have to fix in your history so that you are all ready to go and get your money from investors? So five to 50,000. And then on top of that, right, then we need to talk about blockchain construction. You suggested Ethereum. Ethereum is a great prospective solution, right? The the ERC token series mm -hmm. is a great option to issue for some of these companies. But, but even so, what if maybe a, a public blockchain isn't, isn't really going to meet their needs? Maybe this needs to be a privately managed blockchain. Maybe mm -hmm. this needs to be an independent blockchain. Maybe this needs to be um, a distributed ledger technology that isn't necessarily a blockchain, yeah. right? And, and if we're going to store mega mammoth amounts of, of data, then it's not appropriate to store it on our blockchain, regardless if it's publicly accessible. Maybe we don't want to store it on there because then you got blockchain bloat issues, right? Mm -hmm. So where are we going to store our data? Maybe our data needs to be stored off-chain. And, and if it's being stored off-chain, is it important for us to maintain the essential properties of blockchain of decentralization, exactly. therefore yeah. necessitating, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um sharding sharded data storage like from swarm storage with a j etc cetera, etc cetera. so so we still even even if it's ethereum based we're still going to have to go through the conversation of what is your networking layer 
What is your protocol layer? Mm -hmm. What is your application layer, right? Identifying what are the properties of your blockchain. And then this leads us to the next point in the conversation, which is if your plan is global domination, if your, if your whole business process is built around some sort of a blockchain offering, then we get into what SEC Commissioner um, Hester Pierce just talked about in her speech on February 8th of this year. She talked about the prospect that while your security token could be a security token to start, if you do achieve global domination and your blockchain is so sufficiently decentralized, like Bitcoin is decentralized, yeah. like Ethereum is decentralized, yeah. then we kind of get this issue that I like to call shape-shifting tokens, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you started out as a security token and then through growth and decentralization, at some point you've morphed yourself into what is recognized in the US as a currency. Now yeah. you're not a security, now you're a currency, right? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities, they're currencies, according right. to the SEC and the CFTC mm -hmm. and FinCEN. And so then this also begs the next question, which is, okay, so if we can achieve sufficient decentralization to where a security is no longer a security and now it's a currency, can the same be said backwards? Can we backwards more? So like, for example, I know someone that just pulled 7,000 masternodes off the Bitcoin network because where they had them placed, the cost of electricity became too expensive, right? So they were paying more in electricity than what they were earning in Bitcoin, mm. largely due to the devaluation of Bitcoin for the reasons that we previously discussed. So now that we have 7,000 masternodes that have been removed from the network, now the network is more centralized than it was, right? Mm -hmm. And so nobody is really talking about how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? How many nodes do we need on a network? Where do they have to be geographically placed? And who's got to be operating the nodes until we have achieved this idea of decentralization? When are we decentralized? When are we centralized? Is there this line that we can define? Because we need to be asking this, when are we a security? When are we a currency? And when have we contracted our network to now we're back to a security? So we have this shape-shifting securities. I think that what I foresee folks happening in the future, we're going to see a totally different asset class. We're going to have to. Yeah. It's, it's no to. wonder, you know, that so many people then, you know, uh, go off with this mantra, like, uh, uh, you know, we don't need Bitcoin, but blockchain, because they don't understand, as you said in the beginning, you know, they don't understand the concept, the essence, the structure, the architecture of the real blockchain. Uh, starting with the Bitcoin blockchain, because if they don't fulfill the criteria, you know, as Andreas Antonopoulos always said, or other gurus, uh, if you know, if you don't need, uh, if if you can do it with a database, with a you know, with a dig digital signature, then you don't need blockchain. So it's all this hype and trendy hype that's been going on with you know blockchain but not bitcoin uh it's it's so idiotic but that's uh it's because there's no comprehension no i yeah. don't know maybe a, a lack of education or a lack of i don't know open-mindedness or or understanding whether what is, what is the essence what is the essence of bitcoin blockchain you know yeah here's how i explained it in in my first annual sort of our conference when i got up there and i you remember i spent like 105 hours just preparing for this one hour lecture here's how i explained it and people got it hopefully this will work you can correct me, make it better, right? If, if you think I screwed up somewhere and that is this. So Bitcoin is our first generation blockchain. And it was written with a very primitive programming script back then, basically transfer X coins to Y. End, right? That's the end of it. Then, then we have Ethereum. Ethereum is what I like to refer to as our second generation blockchain. But here's the big wonkin difference that we need to know about between first generation and second generation. What Ethereum did is they said, well, this primitive programming script is pretty nifty, but I wonder if we could do something more with it. So they developed out something called a Turing complete software program and they gave it the name Solidity. And this is where I spent 22 hours, like deep, deep into the study of computer science, which I never did in college, right? And because I was like, what is this bit about Turing complete software programs? And why do I keep seeing it everywhere? Why is this important? And 22 hours later, I came up and I understood, oh, the best way I can describe it is it enables the universe of possibilities in regular contract language to be written into programming code. So I'm fluent in Spanish. 
I have Spanish speaking clients. And sometimes I have to take my English contracts, like my actual legal contracts that I write, and I have to convert them into Spanish. And sometimes I have to take Spanish contracts and convert them into English. We can do this with our contracts that we write, legally binding contracts, and we can convert them into Solidity programming code. Why does this matter? Because it enables us to have self-executing automatic contracts, which everybody's already doing, they just don't know it. For example, my, um, my, my local electric provider automatically deducts the amount of my electric bill from my checking account every month, and I get an email that says, thank you for paying. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's that time again. My bill had to be paid, right? And so sometimes I'll go and I'll check and I'll see the amount, whatever, but it all happens in the background because I set it up. Right. And I, and I checked yes and typed in some information about my bank account and I hit the next button a few times and then confirm and boom. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so it happens every month. This is a self executing program. So what solidity, so what solidity does on the Ethereum blockchain is it enables us to sort of create these really complicated self executing programs and we just set them out there on the blockchain. And then things happen in life, things go along in life, and, and uh, it will go out and it will read certain information on the internet at an agreed upon source like, you know, the Celtics won the game, right? So the Celtics won the game, I'm sorry you lost the bet, and so now the money comes out of your account and goes into your friend's account because they won the bet, right? So you can set these things up. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see, especially in the property industry, hearkening back to your subject matter of real estate investment, real estate investment is a great example of a blockchain use case for self-executing contracts. Because if we can take every title to a piece of property that's ever been written and we store that title on a publicly accessible blockchain so that everybody can look up that property address and see the record of title, what does this mean? If everybody can access wow, the that would be awesome. Title, yeah. What does this mm -hmm. mean? This yeah. means we don't need any title companies. And this means that we don't need any title insurance. And this means the cost of transacting business for to buy a home, it it goes down, right? Substantially. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all of these parties that were involved in the process of transacting a home, we don't need them anymore. Well, they're going to have to go and find some other job to do. But for the homeowner, it's a much cheaper transaction. Now, how blockchain comes in is the properties. The properties of blockchain is that you can't screw it up. Once it's recorded, once you've recorded the title history for that home, that's the title history for the home, always and forever, for a fully decentralized autonomous blockchain recordation system. And, and so now we can set up our buy and sell contracts to also automatically execute on a blockchain. We can do this now. Now in the state of Florida, where I live here in the US, so we have a template property contract that we use here, that the Florida Bar Association real estate property section has put together and everybody in the state, all 20 million people generally use this contract. So we can convert this into solidity and we can set up buyer and seller bank accounts and then all of a sudden everything can happen automatically without title companies. Yeah, that's a lot of efficiency and transparency. Yeah, it, yeah. It really is. Yeah, it and I'm thinking further, is. you know, for the investors also, you know, if, mm -hmm. whatever model, but like if you have properties that whatever you, you take to revitalize, you lease, you rent, so people know exactly what's going on at every point of time, you know, it's so trans, it's full transparency. It's what it be can awesome. be. It yeah. can be, right? Yeah. Because then you get into third generation blockchain, which is IBM Hyperledger Fabric in my estimation. Mm -hmm. And this is where things get a little wonky. Because you have these great initial properties of it being publicly accessible, of being wholly transparent, it be completely decentralized, it's immutable in folks, that means you can't mm -hmm. go back and change it. It's literally written in stone. You can't change the information that's been written to the blockchain. Right. right? So you get these great properties and then IBM Hyperledger Fabric comes along and IBM together in their consortium of over 200 gigantic juggernauts, behemoth corporations and organizations. And they said, let's figure out what we can do with this, right, privately. So they set up their own private blockchain network and they wrote their own um, programming code. And, and so now you've got third generation and now you've got private blockchain, consortium blockchain, and maybe the information is only transparent to them. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so some of these properties that of blockchain that we so appreciate in first generation Bitcoin, second generation Ethereum and, you know, and other ones like that, like Cardano, for example. Right. Those kinds of blockchains. We're not seeing those properties necessarily being carried over to some of these private permissioned consortium operated blockchains like in the Hyperledger Fabric Network. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I say. It's not so easy now when a company says, oh, hey, you know, I just want to issue this on a blockchain. I'm like, okay, what kind of blockchain? Let's sit down. Let's talk about what are the properties that you want your blockchain to have and how we can execute that that makes sense to your prospective investors. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, we need to continue this talk, uh, Anessa. Next time, maybe I would even love to have you with uh, maybe another uh, you know, whoever expert, I'm thinking of, of a couple of people who are even in their respective field would be awesome discussion. But, you know, I uh, really appreciate your, your, your time and your expertise and your sharing your knowledge. Um, yeah, uh, I will, you know, uh, um, add all the, you know, the info, information, your website, if it's, if, it's, if it's cool for you and your article. Sure. And, uh, and get together maybe in the very near future. Do you have any more additional information for conclusion for our viewers and listeners where they can find you or, or any kind of other information? Sure. If you want to talk to me more about blockchain, as you can tell, I love, I can talk about blockchain all day long. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. So my name's Anessa Allen Santos. You can find me on LinkedIn or all of my contact information is also available on my website, which is intellilaw.io. I look forward to hearing from you. All righty. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kayvon. This thank has you, been Anissa. fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so much wiser <laughs> today. Oh. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, okay. Anissa. Bye-bye.